Yes, come and sit down. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a terrific conversation lined up as we take a look at diversity and inclusion in the workplace, but also talk about some of the big labour trends we're seeing out there at the moment. Let, you, let me introduce you to our guests on stage. Joining us today is Tanuj Kabila Sharami, who is the Group Head of HR at Standard Chartered. Beata Yavorchek, who is the Chief Economist of EBRD, and Thomas Sauer Essek, who is the Executive Board Member of SAP. Thank you for joining us. Let's dive in. There are concerns about human capital as we start out 2023. It's a challenging economic year. We're talking about changes to the amount of employees some employers are going to have this year. As we take a look at key things like diversity, equity, and inclusion, Let's just set the starting point. What does 2023 look like first up, and what are the challenges ahead? Piata, do you want to kick it off? Well, I think there are big trends, big changes underway. We had the COVID pandemic, uh, which brought about a recession, and that recession was unique in that it led to much bigger job losses among women rather than male. And that's because it hit disproportionately services industries. While Previous recessions were um, hitting manufacturing much more. So that caused many women in the labor market reevaluate their jobs, rethink where they are, and some of them have not come back yet. Tanish, jump in here. Where do you see the starting point on these issues and what are the challenges ahead this year? Well, I, you know, I think it's a really interesting uh, moment in history, I feel, we are in uh, from a DI perspective. And I think Beata spoke about it very eloquently. What I see is... There is a real war for skills when it comes to the real specialized skills. And I know you will talk about it in your world. So technology, data, you know, cyber. But at the other end, we are seeing that there is a lot of change that's happening in the labor movement. So there's uncertainty around jobs. Uh, they, they are really sort of uh, fear of job losses, et cetera. So it's a very polarized world. Within that, if you take a DNI lens, there is a real danger that as we move towards future skills, there are certain communities that get left behind. You know, women, you know, ethnic minorities, people who do not have the same level of uh, education background in some of those future focus skills. I'll just share a piece of statistic. We did a piece of work where we looked at our workforce plan over three years, five years, seven years, and we looked at the jobs that are going to go away because of automation, digitization, technology, and new jobs that are going to come up. We then overlaid it with gender, and we realized that if we do not take any purposeful action, a percentage of women in our entire workforce will go down by 2% over the next three to four years. And that's simply because there are not enough women in the future-focused, specialized skills job where there is hot demand, and many more in jobs that are not going to be needed for the future. So it's a really interesting time from a skills perspective. Thomas, weigh in here. I mean, first of all, I think we all see the labor shortage on the one hand side and the change in the skill sets which is required. I think I, I read a, a study from the World Economic Forum last year that 1.1 billion jobs will be transformed by technology in the next three years even, which means there's a massive need to do that. But also with regards to diversity, I think one thing needs to be clear to everybody. We talk about the biggest problems here in Davos, like the, the climate crisis. We only can solve that with diverse set of perspective, diverse set of experiences and knowledge across the entire world. So diversity actually will be the key for success to solve this. Also in an intergenerational aspect. I just yesterday had a, had a nice panel with, with young talents and young entrepreneurs. And we need different thinking to solve these big problems in this world. So diversity is for me a key to success. Most of you work across country lines. How do you keep the same level of commitment when we take a look at various countries with various different backdrops and labor forces? You know, I just sort of give our perspective. I totally agree with you. You know, our purpose as a bank is driving commerce and prosperity through our unique diversity. You know, we believe that our proposition is that we can work with and for our clients and bring that diversity to the fore in solving their problems. Representational diversity is important. So you need ethnic, generational, people with all levels of ability, gender. But what is really key is inclusion. You know, I keep saying this, representational diversity is a necessary but not a sufficient condition uh, to get diverse perspectives onto the table. So we've been doing a huge amount of work around the theme of inclusion. And that becomes a much more cross-cutting theme. You know, it's about this idea that everyone has to be included in decision-making process. And we actually measure inclusion 
And the way we measure inclusion is not just around representational diversity, but do people feel free to be able to speak up? Do they have the tools to be able to do their job well? Do they have a real sense of belonging? So I think the idea of inclusion transcends uh, cultures, generations, and gender. Beata? Multinational firms face additional challenges when it comes uh, to diversity, in particular when it comes to gender. Because they have subsidiaries located often in different time zones, that requires people working outside of standard office hours because you need to take early morning phone calls or late night conference calls. And that's particularly challenging for women who in the morning often have to send the kids to school and in the evening have to take care of um, many domestic tasks. And that means that often women are perceived as less able to be flexible. They are often um, given less fewer responsibilities, less challenging roles. And academic research shows that working across time zones is associated with a greater gender wage gap in an organization. I think inclusion is actually the key topic for us also as a company. We produce software for HR purpose, for employers, and how to do that. And inclusive design, but also inclusive language, it starts already with that, is super important to bring the opportunities, equal opportunities to everybody. So also accessibility is a key aspect because I also do believe actually that technology is an enabler for a lot of people to participate actually in the work. We should not underestimate that. When we talk about labor shortage, we need to first ensure that everybody has the opportunity to participate. That's the reason why topics like inclusion in our software and accessibility are key standards for our, for our teams. If I may jump in here, um, digitalization, which sped up during the pandemic, poses additional challenges for older workers. And in particular, in emerging Europe, we see very clearly in various statistics that older workers have much weaker ICT skills um, than older workers in advanced economies. So this, this process of technological progress brings a risk of pushing older workers out of the labor force precisely at the time when demographic challenges mean that we need to have people working longer. As you talk about the societal challenge then, who steps up and fixes this problem? Is there a role for employers or is this a government-driven response that's required here? I think both. I think reaction from both is needed. Firms will do that because it will be in their interest uh, to keep workers and upskill them. Um, and governments will want to do it simply because of pension sustainability. If you let these people leave the labor force, um, that's going to put greater pressure on pensions and it's going to exacerbate um, the demographic challenge. We need to remember that emerging Europe is getting old before it's getting rich. Um, these countries are undergoing demographic transition at the level of income per capita, which is much lower than the level at which advanced economies went through demographic transitions. You know, I represent uh, a bank that's an emerging markets bank. So we're headquartered in, in, in UK, but across uh, markets in Africa, Asia, Middle East. And if you go beyond the more developed world, I think the role of businesses in solving some of these problems becomes absolutely key. You know, I was at Davos, I saw the latest uh, Edelman Trust barometer that got released, and it's fascinating, right? Pretty much across markets, um, there is a growing view among employees and work workers that they see the businesses taking a much stronger role when it comes to skills agenda, when it comes to topics related to DI more broadly, the whole space around employability. Uh, so completely agree with Beata. You know, this, this is a classic space. This, this is a space for collaboration and cooperation as opposed to competition. So I think public, private, education institution, politicians, businesses need to come together to solve it. But I think businesses really, really need to start stepping up and thinking about some of these issues as well. Thomas? I couldn't agree more. I mean, it needs to come together as a community across all the sectors. And I think what we also recognize now with the advancements of the, the internet and how we share knowledge, we need to have more open knowledge sharing and learning. And that's what we see with these massive open online courses, which I believe are amazing. And that's what we will see more. Also, we'll, we will see more micro learnings now with, with the advancements of the devices that if you have, whatever, 10 minutes, you're standing waiting for the train, mm -hmm. use these 10 minutes in a smart way, learn something. And, with, and that's what we will see more. And we need to also ensure how to 
include more of these new concepts actually in a life, in a real lifelong learning concept. We talk so much of, about lifelong learning, but I think we now have everything at hand actually to do it and we, to your point, we need to do it actually. But we also need to awaken aspirations, particularly among women, among minority groups, among people um, from uh, different socioeconomic Background. Um, there is a very telling statistic from Germany. So typically, um, if you look at mathematics scores among teenagers, boys tend to do better than girls. But this gap is smaller in former Eastern Germany than in the former West Germany. And academic research shows that this is due to different aspirations. The legacy of socialists, the legacy of women being uh, very active on the labor market meant um, that girls in that part of, the, of Germany um, had role models and therefore they aspired to work uh, in science, to work in innovation. Actually, East Germany had more female inventors um, than West Germany, if you look as a proportion of patents um, that were filed in the country. It's fascinating, isn't it? I, I want to just get into culture too, because we keep hearing about the upskilling that's required, that uh, the workforce that you want to shape for the future is something you're going to have to create. And that comes back to the heart of the culture of investing. Do you think we've seen enough change in workforces to upskill? Is it really happening on a, a broad basis at this point? I think developing a strong learning culture is absolutely key. You know, it links to the point around aspiration. It links to the point around how do you... Because, you know, the, 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 there is place for technical training, but the world of work is changing so quickly. Technologies are changing so quickly that you need to supplement technical upskilling with upskilling on what I call human skills. So, you know, when we talk about the skills agenda within Standard Chartered, we, we talk about technical skills and human skills. Technical skills are digital data, cyber. Human skills are being able to manage change and ambiguity. You know, how, how do you deal with building a true learning culture? What does inclusive leadership look like? And it's some of those things that we need to, to, uh, to dial up as well. Learning culture is only established when I believe there's a very strong tone from the top and when you celebrate and recognize this. You know, I've given this example at Davos this year a lot. Every month, uh, our CEO and I will send out emails to 15, 20, 25 top learners in the firm. You know, you could be relatively junior from an organizational hierarchy sitting in a, man, in a, in a market in Africa, getting an email from the CEO. And it's those kind of initiative that also, when you start celebrating learning, lifelong learning, that sets that strong learning culture. Beata? You see changes in the demand for various skills when you analyze data on online job ads. So for instance, during COVID in Germany, there was a big increase in demand for disruptive technologies, for knowledge of disruptive technologies, such as AI, machine learning, among managers. Mm. Um, in the UK, if you look at what firms are looking when it comes to supply chain managers, it's green skills that are now very hot. Um, so, you know, these are all new things. These are all new skills we need to learn. And I think this demand is, people are going to, re to respond to this demand. We just need to give them the tools to learn these new skills. Uh, Thomas, a specific question for you. Uh, I gather there's a, a thought process that you believe is necessary for management that uh, effectively you need to step away from human capital management to human experience management. Just flesh out that way of thinking. I think we need to put the people in the center of all of our, of our activities, the real individual one with all the strengths. And that's also, we talk a lot about skills and upskilling, but I think it's way more. You need to consider the whole human being, experiences, passions, interests, because these are the strengths somebody brings together with his whole self. And this is something, if you really think about the whole self of an individual, also for, for HR and for leaders, it's way more important of a very personalized way how to work with these people. And that's different. So we go away from human capital management from a pure transactional process, which for sure we can fulfill a, a leave request or something like that. But that's not what we need to do as leaders. We need to, as leaders, provide the environment that everybody can unleash the full potential of his individual personality. And that's a rethinking. And then also thinking about the entire process, not as a process, but as an experience, as a journey an individual goes through when he gets attracted to a company, when he's getting developed in a company, but also 
if somebody's leaving the company, it's actually the best advocate usually if you do that right for this company. It's the best ambassador if you do it right to consider those aspects as well. And that's also where we need to collect sentiment and feedback along the entire journey to constantly improve your processes. That's what we believe with human experience management, that it's going away from a transactional process to really a personalized, individualized topic for a whole self as a person itself. Can I just very quickly add to that? You know, I say this very often. We are the first generation of employees or workers where the technology we experience in our personal life is better than the technology we experience in our work life. It's a big shift, right? I mean, <laughs> for those of us who started working a long, long time ago, you know, if you had a really important presentation, you would come to office over a weekend because technology was just much better. And actually, this idea of how do we give that consumer-grade yes, experience exactly to employees has to be at the heart of design. And that links to the learning agenda as well. You know, people will consume content, have that aspiration to consume it. If it is driven in a way or delivered in a way which is personalized, which is easy to access, feels modern, and it's closer to how they experience technology in their personal life. But of course, we are facing a huge shift in the way we work also when it comes to the hybrid world, right? I think gone is Monday through Friday in the office. And I think we need to be aware of what this means for diversity and inclusion. Now, if you remember COVID, we all worked remotely, and that was a very different experience for men and women. Um, typically, women were the ones who spent more time on childcare, um, Typically, they were the ones who were working at the kitchen table um, while their partners had typically a de dedicated office. It was women who were more likely to think about quitting. And, and women, actually, early in the pandemic, quit in larger numbers than men. And, you know, in some cases, um, that was a family decision to prioritize the husband's work simply because he was making more money. Um, but interestingly, you observed similar pattern among households where the wife made more money. Even in those households, uh, the wife, who was a better earner, took more time, uh, spent more time with the kids. And you know, while making the family decision to prioritize um, the husband's career would seem rational, there is a problem. There is a wage gender wage gap, there is a glass ceiling out there. So we've put skilled women behind during the pandemic simply because while um, their male colleagues could excel, could show their bosses um, how well they were doing, they, had, they were not wasting time for the commute, women were carrying a bigger burden on the home front. And I think we haven't fully recovered from that setback. I think we've touched a lot on the necessity for flexibility. So I want to ask you what happens going into an economic downturn where companies are already drawing up lists of staff numbers to reduce. The balance of power is subtly shifting back to the employer in that context. How do employers then need to think about the demands they have on employees, the days they come in, how many days they should be, you know, where they should be working from? I mean, from our perspective, we believe in pledge to flex and giving flexibility to the, to the employees because we have highly skilled uh, and, and highly educated uh, people in the workforce. And we also need to actually fight to attract those people. And that means flexibility is a key aspect. So we trust that they take the right decisions when they come actually to the office and when not. And we clearly see in areas like when you do an innovation workshop, you want to be there in person. It's unleashed energy. But I also, to your point, giving flexibility also in aspects when you want to work on a dedicated document to be at home, also to, to balance the private life and the, and the work life in a better meaning. And we need to provide this opportunity to employers. And I believe this is super important in this war for talent. I mean, with all what we read, we still have labor shortage, and we need to fight to, to get the best talent. And that's the reason we need to have a super attractive uh, work environment to, to succeed in this market. 75% of our global workforce now across 43 markets is on formal, flexible working, hybrid working arrangements. We have found very different, very little difference between men and women taking up flexibility. So this idea of the fact that, you know, it's just women who are signing up for hybrid, we've not seen that, right? And I'm completely with Beata to say, over lockdown, women had to take disproportionate amount of burden of uh, home responsibility, care responsibility. But in the data we are seeing, we are finding that there has been a subtle societal shift and men have got more engaged 
in, in issues of childcare, and they have had a really high take up of, um, of hybrid. The couple of things I will say, we've been very clear on moments that matter where people need to come together physically. So we've said hybrid is not fully office or fully, fully home. And there are certain moments that matter that you need to come together and, and, and you know, ideate and innovate and solve problems. And you know, we've been very, very clear that in designing those moments that matter, we've been quite inclusive in our thinking. But the other thing that we have done, and I think all companies need to do, is to start evolving the data sets by which they measure progress. So when we came to our year-end promotion round, we always did diversity checks, you know, external, internal, A checks. We also did a correlation with people's working arrangements, just to be very sure that people who had signed up for additional days of working from home were not disadvantaged in being up for, for, for promotions. So look, nobody really has the crystal ball. I mean, there's been a lot of conversations to say, 10 years of flexible working, five years, we'll realize it was a disastrous experiment. My personal view is flexibility is here to stay. It's become a core part of the employment proposition, especially when it comes to highly skilled workforce. But it's incumbent upon businesses to ensure that the program is designed in a way that it does not erode culture, it does not make workplaces less inclusive, and it does not uh, erode the traditional apprenticeship model, which is really, really important in businesses like ours. Yeah, do you think there is a chance of rollback around flexibility as we go into a slightly less tight labor market? I don't think so. I think flexibility is here to stay, um, simply because flexibility is associated with higher productivity. You see it very clearly in the data that people use a vast chunk, if not majority, of the time they save on commuting, they use this time to work. And you see it across countries. Um, we've done surveys in emerging Europe, in Western Europe, and you clearly see that about 80% of people report higher productivity uh, during working from home hours. But of course, there is the issue that uh, you raised of monitoring the data by gender. Right? There are two things happening now. On the one hand, we had great resignation, um, which means that childcare may become more scarce and uh, more expensive. And that's going to put pressure on women to spend more time working from home. On the other hand, you know, we have an economic downturn. And as you mentioned, companies may be drawing up lists of uh, redundancies. And that may mean that women who spend more time at home put less face time at work may be disadvantaged when it comes to layoffs. And I think that it is absolutely crucial to, to monitor the data just like you do that. There's two points I want to pick up on here. Number one, the term, the great resignation. Can we retire it yet, or is it still happening, Thomas? I think, I think we're at a time where I think every company on this planet is really fighting for the right people, and that's what we keep continuing doing. And I also believe that sometimes these, these terms, I have to say, it's a, it's a little bit sometimes also where I believe we need to deduct it a little bit of what it really means, because for, if some people are leaving the one company, it's actually an opportunity for another company to attract amazing talent as well. Um, but, I, but I absolutely do believe that also in, in this current market, as we laid out, we cannot stop in thinking about what are the right attractive models like flexibility, like, uh, like other aspects of work, to, to also retain the best talent and also to motivate them uh, again. Because I, I think the last couple of years were hard for everybody in all aspects. First, we had the, the, the corona um, uh, crisis. Now we have a, a devastating war and, and the impacts. So I think the last three years have put a lot of burden on everybody. And it's very important for us to, to keep the motivation, keep the positive spirit. When I'm walking here after this week in Davos, I get a sense of cautious optimism, which is good. And I hope that this sense is also sprinkling through the world again, because I believe we need a, an optimistic view to the future and motivation for the teams. But Thomas, anecdotally, if you just think about your own organization, are you still hearing the, oh, I'm, I'm resigning and I'm just going to sell off into the sunset, I'm going traveling. I don't have anything else lined up. I might just take some time off. Are you hearing that as much as we were we're hearing it to several months ago? No, we don't hear that any much, anymore that much. Look, I'm not even very sure people, a lot of the great resignation was simply because I was walking to the sunset, right? I mean, let's be honest. Some of the onset of the great resignation was also a lot of pent up sort of demand from a movement. So two years, people just stayed still trying to deal with this big humanitarian crisis, which affected pretty much everyone in some way or the other, right? 
So I think the initial bit of coming back from COVID and the increase in resignation we saw, there was a little bit of that pent up sort of demand of people. The other bit was, as you say, evaluating life and options, right? And I always keep saying, when we talk about flexibility in our company, flexibility is not just where you work. It's also when you work, how you work, and why you work. A lot of people started thinking, is this the company I want to work for? And it wasn't always because I don't want to work for anyone. You know, it was because, you know, I'm judging you in the way you have responded during COVID. You know, I'm judging you in the way you've thought of your customer and your employees. I'm judging you in the way you are thinking about the climate challenge and the role that we have to play. So I think the, the, the great resignation was also as a result of people really evaluating, is this the company I want to be part of? Some of that is tapering down, but it's not going to fully go away. Yeah, I think... I think there has been something pretty fundamental that's happened, you know, the years of the pandemic. And a lot of people are being far more intentional about the choices they make, which includes the employer that they choose to work, work for. Yes, let me turn to you. The great resignation, is it still happening by numbers? Probably not. But, you know, if you think about um, inertia, there's a lot of inertia. People stay in jobs they don't like, they don't enjoy, because it takes a lot of effort um, to look for a new employment. Um, so if there is a shock um, that suddenly means that you lose your job, um, as, as was the case with many services workers during the pandemic, then you are forced to rethink what you want, how you want to live, how you want to uh, spend your time. And for instance, in the UK, we've seen a lot of people 55 plus leaving the labour market and actually not coming back. I want to pick up on one of the most interesting stories that's captured my attention in recent weeks, and this is a regulator's stateside. The FTC is considering making non-compete clauses illegal. So all of these lock-up periods, uh, effectively, where you're handcuffed for a period of time, uh, they're looking at doing away with that. The exception here could be on the sale of a business, for instance. What's the potential of legislation like this do you think, across the world, beyond the United States, and what impact would it have on the labour force? I think actually on a global scale, we have different uh, laws by country, and in some countries already, there's a non-compete is not, uh, not possible, which means as a global company, we anyway need to uh, accept that uh, some talent is leaving to a competitor, quote by quote. Uh, but also here, that's what I meant in the, in, the, in, the, in the beginning. It's also when people leave, this is opportunity. Even if they go to a competitor, they can leave on the right terms to still be an ambassador to, to this company. And so I believe, for sure, this, this has certain impacts on, on certain countries. But on a, as you, anyway, as a global company, that's the reality that you see people moving to competitors and also competitors uh, where people join our forces. So I think that's a natural movement which, which we see. So I, I don't believe this has a big impact, actually, at scale on a, on a, on a There are still a lot of jokes there around gardening leave. You know, I've just finished one, one job and I'm just you know, kicking around doing not very much for, for several months waiting to start the next position. That does slow things down. Should we get to the point where employees can finish a job one day and go straight into a rival organisation the next? I think in some countries that's the reality today. It is. I mean, a lot of the non-compete gardening is a very Western construct. I mean, it's not enforceable across the majority of Asian emerging markets. But, you know, I'll give a slightly different... It's a really interesting question, right? I mean, one of the things... Uh, we run millennial councils in all of our big markets. Uh, typically, when I travel, I always spend some time with our millennial talent, which is a fascinating perspective, right? And one of the things I asked uh, our millennial council a couple of weeks ago in Mumbai, in our Mumbai offices, was... How many of you, in addition to this job, it's a full-time job, have a gig on the side? 75% of them raise their hand, right? W what do you do? You know, I'm a food blogger. What do you do? I volunteer in an NGO. I have come up with an app with my friend that does demand and market. And there is just something about, if you talk about future of work, this idea that people are not going to have one job for life. And actually, people will have multiple jobs at the same time. And if you believe that to be true, this idea of multiple gigs at the same time, and gig working is already so big in, in various sectors, a lot of that goes against the way traditional contracts have been structured, right? A traditional contract is you cannot be in dual employment, but you're dealing with a workforce that is just thinking about gigs very differently. So look, traditional businesses like ours will have to start thinking about, I mean, not just on the non-compete base or, or gardening, but just start thinking about do we have a structure which is really inclusive and aligned to what future generations of talent is looking for in their employers? I think that doing away with no compete clauses is a good idea. Let me explain why. 
If you look at where the most productive firms are, typically in cities. And that's because when you have a lot of workers in one place, they mingle, they exchange ideas. So there's this flow of knowledge uh, between workers from different firms. Now, the movement to hybrid work means that we have suddenly fewer people uh, in city centers, and there is a risk that you know, this density of ideas will go down. There will be fewer knowledge flows, and that's going to slow down economic growth. So one way of counteracting it is facilitating flows of people across companies, and doing away with no-compete clauses is going to do that. Another big theme here in Davos has been what we're seeing in terms of rethinking supply chains, just reassessing across the board uh, where we're getting sort of services and products from. Part of this is who we're working with. And if you look at some of the numbers, female entrepreneurs are still not getting enough slice of future business. Why is this? Why is it taking so long to correct? Well, I mean, I'll just give you uh, our perspective. I mean, we've realized that while there's been a huge amount of focus on the E and G of ESG, the area of S has, everyone sort of interpreted it in their own way. And uh, in businesses, S has largely been, to my mind, about risk mitigation. And the pendulum is swinging. You know, the S of ESG is much more about pro-social behavior. And supply chain and diverse, uh, supplier diversity is becoming an absolutely big part of the agenda. So, you know, for us, you know, we realized that actually th there was such a high barrier to entry of, uh, you know, small entrepreneurs, female-led businesses, minority-led businesses, just because of our governance processes, you know, just how cumbersome it is. Um, you know, it's easy for SAP to, to break in, but incredibly difficult for a small business owner, minority business owners to work in. And that was a real wake-up call for us to say that if we don't make structural changes in the way we source suppliers, we work with suppliers on onboarding process, support them on sort of technology, we are never going to be able to meet some of our supplier diversity challenges. So I do believe the, the, the supplier diversity piece, which to me is part of the, 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 the S of ESG, has been behind the curve. But I'm seeing a huge amount of green shoots. There's been a, a, a huge level of, uh, of uh, partnership that's happening uh, between companies, uh, governmental organizations, NGOs that are working in this space to try and correct that gap. The time to think about supplier diversity is now. And that's because we've seen the process of reshaping of global value chains yeah. starting. And it's starting in, um, with a force. It's, it's, it's um, about, about two-thirds of German firms reported having already added an additional supplier. And half of the firms intend to do so in the coming year. So I think... If we really want to make a difference now, as we are changing who we source from, we need to pay attention to diversity of suppliers. And I think also technology can help here because we need to give transparency that actually you know that these social entrepreneurs of, or female entrepreneurs are there. So we provide a business network where we have more than 5 million trading partners. And we actually over-promote now the aspect of sustainability in all aspects, which means for sure we talk about ethical sourcing aspects, which are super important to avoid child labor, but also different categories like what you mentioned to, to mark this is a female entrepreneur. So basically, if you want to look for a new supplier, you can now pick and choose from 5 million and that's growing, and that's an opportunity. So technology can help overcome also these hurdles and, and support in these cases. And that's, I can just fully agree, when I look at our data, absolutely, we see way more connections going on in, in the network of companies getting together. And that's also interesting because you go away from these bi-directional connections from companies really in value networks. So you really have these this end-to-end connections, and with that, if you have then the right setup, you can quickly also adjust the supply chain, which is super important. That's the reason why supply diversity is so important, because some supplier will face a, a shortage on their supplier, because it's a, it's, a, it's a tier of supply chain. And then you need to be able to switch that, and that's something where technology absolutely can, can help. Are you seeing enough female entrepreneurs pitch, though, for work? Because by numbers, it looks as though they're not getting access to the VC funding first up. So getting to the point where you're ready to pitch to a major company uh, could be an issue if you're not getting that early funding. We just in Germany, we launched uh, Enco Ventures, which is a, which is a dedicated um, uh, venture which is only looking for female entrepreneurs and innovators, actually uh, founded by one of the former SAP uh, employees, and I'm fully supportive of that. And it's creating a huge network for, for female innovators and entrepreneurs coming together and get the VC funding, and that's a good starting point in Germany. We need more of that uh, across the globe, and I think it's starting that movement, and I can just applaud uh, the team who actually did that. 
And I'm really looking forward to see more of the successes, actually. I mean, Beata can share the data, but the data is very clear. The, the, the funding that's av available for women, uh, women and minority-owned businesses is absolutely at, no, uh, at the same level as it is for men. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, I heard that it's even lower than when the businesses are owned by a man and a woman. So actually, a woman-owned business is the lowest end of the, of the spectrum. Loads of great initiatives. You know, we, we've got an, a biz, uh, an initiative now in five of our markets called Women in Business, which is not just about funding uh, credit facilities, but also <clears throat> some of the softer aspects that we can bring into making the connections, building the network, providing them mentoring uh, uh, from sort of um, uh, other female. So there are loads of initiatives that are, uh, that are going on, but the gap is, is, is pretty material. So the gap is there because women find it harder to obtain funding. Uh, my colleagues at EBRD did a fascinating study in Turkey. They asked loan officers uh, working for real Turkish banks to evaluate hypothetical loan applications. Um, and the applications were, came in two versions. They were identical, except on some applications, the applicant was male, and on the others, it was a female. And what they found was that women were typically asked to provide more collateral, right? which is a very clear sign of there being a bias against uh, lending to women. So there's certainly scope for policy. Um, there's scope, for instance, for SME credit directed particularly at female entrepreneurs, and that's actually what institutions like mine are engaged in supporting. I want to use the final amount of time that we have to tap into how you're all looking at the labour market at this point, because central banks are certainly hoping that this wage price spiral that they've seen that is triggering more inflation will come to an end. The tightness in the labour market is a problem for them at this point. If you look at your own labour markets, if you look at some of the data, what are you seeing at this point? Do you think some of the heat is coming out of the labour market? Are you still compelled to give pay rise after pay rise just to protect or keep workers with you? I mean, I think uh, it's, it's not possible to always match the inflation rate. I think that that would not work from an economic perspective from a company. But I think it is absolutely a call to action to re rethink what can we do with additional benefits, because it's not just about salary, which is for sure a super important component. I mean, let's be clear. But I think a company offers more benefits. And also to your point, I think it was very good what you mentioned. It's also about giving more purpose to the individual work and to the, to the work where you participate. And so companies need to rethink the entire package of all benefits, all aspects of work, and that needs to be an attractive equation for the individual talent, which we talk about. And that's something where you need to double down. But I, but I believe from a pure economic perspective, I don't believe matching always the inflation rate when it goes up. Uh, is, is not always the right thing, as we also don't uh, actually reduce uh, the salary if the, if the inflation, like two years ago, is, is vice versa. Um, so I think we, we need to find the right way to develop that and, and, and with additional benefits to see that for sure we need to attract the team. Do you believe the, the labour market is normalising as you take a look at your various different markets? Does it feel like normal conditions are prevailing? What do you mean with normal uh, conditions in this regards? You, you don't have either a huge queue of people outside waiting That's for a job okay. or no one outside waiting for a job. I mean, somewhere where it looks like it, it has in history. Uh, from our perspective, I mean, we, are, we have the, the privilege that we have a very attractive proposition. So we have a lot of applicants for all of our jobs we have out there. A lot of new technologies like AI. We talk here also today a lot about AI and what, what the new chat GPT advancements can bring. So with these very innovative top jobs, we see on a global scale still a lot of applicants uh, for those kind of roles. So we don't see that, that this is slowing down. But for sure, this is an individual perspective on yeah. SAP. And the market certainly will, will have different perspectives as well. Can I just very quickly add to that? Because it, to sh the short answer to your question is the heat going away. My answer is it depends, right? It depends on two things. Uh, east versus West, there's definitely a difference that we are seeing. And specialized skills, you know, jobs in technology, sustainability, cyber, so very specialized skills versus less specialized skills. And it is a story. We started the conversation and I'm going to come back. It is a story of two halves at this point in time. So am I seeing the heat coming away when it comes to super specialist, high-end skills? Short answer is no. Um, uh, but it's a very different story if you are at the other end of the, of the spectrum. And the east versus west, what are you seeing? Uh, I mean, e emerging markets, uh, some of the fastest growing emerging markets today, markets in Asia, parts of the Middle East, um, you know, it's booming. Uh, it, 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 for specialized skills, there's a real war for skills and talent. And there is a premium that's being paid. Now, 
progressive employers are taking the view that we are not going to keep throwing money at the problem. And you know, we talk about defining and delivering an employment proposition, which is far more holistic. And we talk about it very openly. You know, we are not going to win this just on pay levels. We'll pay fairly, we'll pay transparently, but you come and work for us because of purpose led business, a really inclusive environment, focus on learning and development. But I, I still see that real war for skills going on for specialist skills in emerging markets. Last summer, we saw red hot labor markets in emerging Europe. The Polish labor market alone absorbed 440,000 Ukrainian refugees. However, this is coming to an end as the economic slowdown is setting in. We see um, wage increases going away, actually. So this uh, wage price spiral is not there anymore. What's and that? that's European data. That's emerging Europe. Yeah. And what sort of increases are we settling back down to in terms of those uh, wage increases? They are, the increases are certainly very far from compensating inflation. Um, we need to remember that in emerging Europe, there is double digit inflation and it's you know, about 18 percent, in some countries above 20 percent. Um, so workers are actually taking a pay cut in real terms. But because everybody understands that there are clouds gathering on the horizon, that we are entering a phase of weaker economic growth, actually workers are willing to accept that. I think we've touched on a lot of issues. And uh, just as we wrap up, I might just get a quick takeaway message from each of you about how employers need to think about tackling the topics of diversity and inclusion this year. What concrete step can they do that they're not doing at this point? Well, I mean, I, I would say we keep talking about segments of diversity, gender, ethnicity today. My big issue is to focus on inclusion. And, you know, unless you start thinking about some of the intersectionality between various streams of diversity, we are not really going to make uh, progress. I also want to touch upon the idea of lived experience. You know, the lived experience of a woman is very different in the West and in the East. And, you know, this idea of you can look at it in a black and white way doesn't, doesn't work. And that's why inclusion is key to unlocking the full potential of diversity. Role models. I mean, it's well known that a woman is hesitant to apply for a position unless she meets all the criteria, while a man is happy to do so when he ticks six out of ten boxes. And that's why we need role models to show women that they can do it, that they can rise to the very top. Yeah, I mean, as is said, I mean, diverse com companies are more successful, so we need to work on inclusion to become even more successful. So it's a super important topic for all of us to double down and focus and share all these role model examples across all companies because we can learn from each other, sharing the best practices. So we should talk way more about that topic actually across all companies. It has been a very dynamic panel. I appreciate all the energy you've thrown at this. Thank you so much for joining us here in the CNBC sanctuary. Tanuj, Pieta and Thomas, we appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.